Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Davis. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for DC Public Schools. We wanted to spend some time with you today and share some information about HVAC. Um, air quality is a question we get quite a bit um, from parents, students, and staff, and specifically what we're doing to improve air quality um, in all of our school buildings through the public health emergency. HVAC is one of the things we've done through our layered approach to public uh, safety in our schools. Um, and we want to share more about what we're doing, um, what we've done and what we plan to do going into next school year. Um, I had a chance to sit down, sit down with Raj Seti uh, last week. Raj is the president of Seti and Associates, who is the third party mechanical engineering firm that worked with us uh, to design and implement the enhancement program to increase ventilation and filtration across all of our school buildings. We hope you find that this information informative. Um, so here's a conversation that I have with Raj Shetty and hope you enjoy. So initially when the pandemic hit, there was a debate within the fields, the scientific fields of whether it was airborne or uh, what we call fomite, basically that it lands on surfaces. So ASHRAE, which is the uh, nonprofit technical committee and organization, we took the position that it is airborne and to start to address the air. And what is the centralized system in every building is your HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning units. And so we know all the air will come back to these main units. So let's go ahead and figure out how we can address those main units. So we've been doing this type of, um, we'll call it filtering of air, cleaning of air in our hospital designs, in our lab designs. Uh, when you go in for an operation into an operating room, we try to change all the air between operations 20 times. So why don't we apply those principles to make sure we handle all those airborne infectious um, particles in the air. So that was kind of the approach. And then we started to apply it for buildings and schools. So knowing that not every one of our buildings is uniform or the same, as I mentioned, some schools have been modernized, some schools have not. And every school has a bit of a different, uh, you know, layout and system uh, for HVAC. How did you approach sort of the unique nature of, of the DCPS portfolio? So with the DCPS portfolio, just getting into some of the numbers, there's over five and a half thousand unique HVAC pieces of equipment. So what we did was we went and evaluated every single school, within each school, every piece of equipment. We looked at its model numbers, serial numbers. There's a huge team um, that assisted us on this. We looked at their operating condition. We looked at their filter status, and we also looked at their fresh air capabilities. There's three things that we can do. Bring in more fresh air, ventilation, filtration, and then disinfection. Those are our three main tools to handle airborne infectious isolation. So that's what we did. So for, for filters, we've all heard at this point probably the term MERV or HEPA. Can you explain what a MERV uh, filter is and what a HEPA filter is? Sure. So in the arcane world of filters, it is basically what particles the filter can stop minimum efficiency rating value. So that's all a MERV is. So now we're looking, so the virus, in our case, the COVID virus is at 0.12 microns. Um, it doesn't can float you see, in the, wait, Can you see that with your eye? No, you can. It's smaller than hair. Yeah. So, and it doesn't float around by itself. It attaches to respiratory droplets or particles. So then our goal was to find the filter size that stops those particles. So then I have an indirect correlation that if I'm picking up all the filters at 0.1 microns and above, then I'm going to be picking up the viral particles in that filter. So that's how we were able to filter. That's what we do in hospitals. HEPA is the highest efficiency particle um, arrester and that stops that's what we use in hospitals so those type of filters are what we're trying to do now the side effect is when you have a blockage in the air which is what a filter is you lose some air capacity so we have to weigh that and make sure the motors can handle it um, and that's why we have to do a system by system evaluation
So as we looked at each, take a school for example, some of the units were very small in the classroom and they couldn't handle a filter upgrade. So the way we address that is to put in a local air cleaner with a HEPA. So to answer your question directly, yes. 100% when the big units could handle a MERV 13 upgrade, that was done. When it, we weren't able to um, put change those filters in this, mainly in the smaller units, then we put in that air cleaner, which had the highest filtration available. So we're also locally cleaning all that air. And is there any, have there been any studies to show how this, these interventions would reduce transmission of the virus? So the terms we always want to use is we're reducing the probability of infection. We're reducing the probability of transmission. So the studies uh, on the COVID viruses are all coming now, but what we have been using are the studies on the influenza, which is a very similar enveloped virus. So we have a lot of good data on influenza um, pandemics that were done back in the 1900s. And so with that, it was more ventilation, more fresh air. If you think about New York City buildings, they're all sized to have windows open in the winter. That's why they're big overheating steam systems. So there are plenty of studies on the influenza and now the COVID study. So we are seeing that more fresh air, better filtration are the ways to handle those airborne infectious and reduce the probability. Um, so we've, we've done this work and it's been in place since uh, term three when, when some of our students and staff came back. Um, has it worked? What have you seen in the, in the data? So that's the question. As a parent now, as a DC parent, I'm, I listen to all this. I'm going to put on my parent hat. I'm like, well, is it working? So the only way we know it's working is if we put in independent sensors. And that's what we've done. We've deployed over 1,200 sensors, approximately 10 to 15 per school. So we are now monitoring uh, over 2 billion discrete data points a day. And what we do are look for the carbon dioxide levels. We look for the total volatile organic compound levels, and we look for the particulate levels. So when our particulate levels, we've set thresholds for all of them, stay below the thresholds, we know our filters are filtering. Great. I know we're picking up the virus. We set that at PM 2.5 and PM 0.5, looking at all the particles. Carbon dioxide, when we breathe, we generate carbon dioxide. The ASHRAE guidance is to ventilate, right? What's the best classroom? Just being under a tree, 70 degrees outside, lots of air moving. Um, then your risk of exposure plummets because we have a lot of fresh air. So we wanna bring in fresh air. In the DC area, we know the number of parts per million of carbon dioxide outside, which is 415 parts per million. So when our inside reaches uh, in that range of 450 parts per million, we know we've done a good job of bringing in fresh air into the building. So it's a very discreet way of monitoring. If I stay in a room, I generate carbon dioxide and it just builds up. So all those sensor data, all that number is, they're coming in right now. We monitor it every day and we generate a report that goes out to the DGS um, DC facility staff, and they start to make adjustments to the systems. So you're going to always have varied systems. We've gotten into a really good cadence now. It's taken a little time to get ramped up to fix it, right? That's what we want to do is fix it and get the air quality back to where it is. In a simple nutshell, our only two main levers are bringing in more fresh air and running units longer. So there's more time to filter. Um, so those are the kind of the tools that we use to get that air quality back in under the thresholds. So you mentioned you're, you're a DCPS parent and knowing all this data and what you've done to date, um, would you have any reservations about sending your, your children back to an in-person learning environment? None at all. At this point, um, Hardy and School Without Walls, that's where my kids go. So looking at that, just making sure that the air cleaners are in each classroom, which they are, I've looked at it myself, and then it's just about running them operationally. You know, these things are pretty basic. Um, 
systems, you just run the air through a filter. And now we're picking up all those particles. It sounds so simple. And the reality is it is really simple. I mean, that's the beauty of addressing the air. We can turn all that air over four to six times an hour. Um, and that's what we want to see. And we've got that good cadence now. The other place is there's some areas that you can't socially distance in a school, which are the bathrooms. So we did put some of these more um, permanent type fixtures in the ceilings. So when you go into a bathroom, you'll see these with LED lights and those are just running 24 seven, just cleaning all the air in the bathrooms, just running it through. Um, so air is air, you don't really see it, but you can hear these air cleaners being on. And now we have the sensor data um, showing that we've got good ventilation. So we mentioned, um, you know, your position on the, the national nonprofit and the work you've you've done across the country. Um, how does the work that we've done here at DCPS compare to what what you're seeing in the sort of the national landscape? Are we doing more? Are we doing less? So we are personally working with around 40 different school systems um, around the nation. DC being one of the largest, as well as Atlanta Public Schools. DC is in front at this point of almost all the school systems and what they've implemented. The last tranche of federal funding, um, everyone now is looking at that and they're doing the exact type of projects, you know, increasing your ventilation, looking at the air cleaning methodology. So right now, DC is at a place where we're making adjustments in real time because we have all the data. We're going on almost six months of data on what's working, what's not working, and how to now tweak it. And that's why as we hit this um, next few months in the school year, uh, our air quality is gonna be one of the highest levels out there. We've also added um, in these air cleaners, what's called UVC, ultraviolet C, which is a simple um, bandwidth of light, and that stops the virus from replicating. So as you breathe, if you are someone who has viral particles, you're generating COVID, excuse me, not COVID, quanta particles, and we want to stop that from replicating. So all these air cleaners also have the UVC, which is one more layered approach of uh, protection. I, I read in the news uh, a few, few weeks ago or months ago about some of these air scrubbers creating ozone. Um, did, you, did that go into your thinking when picking the products that went into DCBS? We've evaluated, um, there's a lot of different products out on the marketplace. If they have not been tested by an independent third party, then we did not use those in the DC program. Um, so any um, technology that had even just a faint hint of possibly generating ozone, which is not good for people, um, we did not use that, so. So the core principles will always be those air cleaners in the classrooms. Um, they need to be operational. They only have one main moving part, which is a fan motor. So as long as that fan motor is operational, it'll be pushing air across that filter, pull it out of the room, across the filter. The main building units, um, the main air filters have to be stay upgraded at that MERV 13 level. And then finally, and probably the most important piece is anything associated with bringing fresh air into the building. Sometimes it's a damper, sometimes it's an individual unit that has to be operational. We have to get ventilation, we call it that uh, fresh air into the building. We need to push, change all the air in the building at least two to four times an hour. We want to rotate it all through. So we get that question a lot. Um, can you explain how fresh air is brought into the building? I think people, you know, associate opening the window with bringing in fresh air, which is certainly one way to do it. But um, at the system level, can you talk through how many of our buildings, in fact, most of our buildings are bringing in fresh air uh, through the system? So. I think going back 20 to almost 30 years ago, it was code mandated. It's required by law to bring in fresh air to any HVAC system. So typically most units are anywhere from 20% to 100% fresh air. The fresh air percentage 
is defined by how many occupants there are. So if we have a space like a gym that can see a very high occupant level, we bring in more fresh air. So all of these, not just the modernized, um, but even the older buildings have the ability to bring in fresh air. From an HVAC mechanical engineering perspective, we'd like to control the amount of fresh air that we bring in and then condition it. Otherwise, you're going to bring in very moist air and have the possibility of mold. Um, in our area, it's very humid. We don't want to bring in all that 90 degree, 95 degree hot, humid air into the classroom. And that's why opening windows is a way to um, offset your thermal comfort. We still want to keep that. So all the units bring in fresh air, condition it, cool it or heat it, and then um, distribute it in, mix it in with some of the return air and then distribute it back again. Got it. Um, so a lot of this work we're, we're doing is obviously a reaction to COVID, um, but we're all, you know, excited to get out of this COVID environment and back to uh, normalcy. Um, are these things just going to be, you know, is this wasted effort in, in the future? Or are these just sort of good principles to keep uh, keep thinking about once we come out of the pandemic? These are the most important principles on a school environment at this point is the air. Similar to how we looked at food in the cafeterias, we looked at lead in the water, now we're addressing the air. Having a high level of air quality within a school does help the cognitive abilities of the kids to learn, teachers to teach. That is a new paradigm. We want to get better air quality into the space. So it's not biology class putting kids to sleep. It's it's higher levels of CO2. Exactly. Now it's Zoom that's putting them to sleep. Yeah, that, there you go. <laughs> um, so we'll end on this. And it's just a general question. You mentioned you're a DCPS parent. I talked about it. If a parent, um, you know, fellow parent came up to you in the street, what are the sort of two line things you would say to them in terms of air quality that would, uh, if they were to ask you, is it safe to send my kid back? Um, what would you say from an air quality standpoint at DCPS? So the most important thing um, is always to go in that layered approach. The child is sick, stay at home. If you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Wear a mask, that stops the very close contact. If someone sneezes four feet away, then that is what we want to stop. Then you go to the next layer. So now we look at the air. So as long as we're filtering the air, diluting the air with fresh air ventilation, and then treating it with the UVC, we're going to reduce that probability of infection. And that's the goal. And the way we looked at DC was to get that probability way under 5%. And the projects, we took the science-based, math-based approach. Um, and I'm very comfortable with how we did it, just moving all that air around. So all the studies are coming in. So I'm 100% behind that. I will put my kids in back in school. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Raj. And, and thank you for all the work you've done for all of us. Um, you know, we're really appreciative of all the time and effort you and the team have put in. And, and thanks for joining us on this video. Really appreciate it. You got it. And thank you, Patrick. And you guys have been trend centers out there in the, the national front. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Raj about HVAC systems and your questions were answered during the, the video there. For more information on our plans for reopening next school year, make sure you visit dcpsreopeningstrong.com.